Hello and welcome again to ResNet Lab on Tour. Today I'm going to be talking to you about Interplanetary Linked Data, or IPLD. This is the agenda of what I'm going to cover today. We're going to look at the motivation, why we need IPLD, what is it, why does it exist, why is it a separate thing. We'll look at the relationship between IPFS and IPLD. We're going to look at some fundamental concepts, so we're going to dig in a bit to, to graphs and of linked data and then we'll talk about Merkle DAGs and Merkle Roots, explain some of these terms, and we'll talk about links because they really are at the, the heart of IPLD. Then we'll move beyond file data as we've, we've conceptualized it in IPFS and see what else we can do with IPLD because IPFS is typically thought about as being file data, but IPLD actually has a lot of power in it that moves way beyond file data. We'll look at the data model of IPLD, we'll look at some codecs that uh, move beyond file data and uh, and lastly we'll look at some distributed data structures with an example that will hopefully help get your mind stimulated about what this all means and what the potential is. Okay let's dive into what it is and why it's needed. In summary IPLD is the data layer for content address systems. It's very ambitious but uh, IPLD is trying to be that trying to be that layer when you're building content address systems. It, asks, it, it comes from asking the question, can we extract a reusable data layer from IPFS that can be used to build other types of content address systems? Uh, and a quote from my colleague Eric Meyer says, building the next Git should take hours and not days. You shouldn't have to waste your time solving all of these complex content address data uh, problems when we've solved it for you. Um, you should get on with building your very interesting system uh, on top of content address data. So furthermore, when we put it all together, we end up with IPLD as a, as a system of leverage, a way to use the technologies to um, build content address systems uh, to get the power that comes with that. Um, it looks at how we can scale the size and complexity of the data that we share peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, content addressing is great for peer-to-peer. Uh, can we unify disparate content address formats and link between them, Git, blockchains, IPFS, etc.? Can we build distributed data structures that we can interact with like we do with hosted databases while taking advantage of, advantages of the benefits of content addressing? So we're looking at things like uh, immutability, um, deduplication, identity, um, and, and the shared way of reasoning about data when we're doing content addressing because content is stable, the addresses for the content is stable over time. Um, so how can we take advantage of the full package of benefits of content addressing, build systems on top of that, and not have to worry about reinventing all the wheels that every content address system seems to need to do. IPFS and IPLD, these two things obviously are related, they uh, share most of their acronym. Um, IPLD can be thought of as the data layer of IPFS. IPLD was originally extracted from IPFS because we realized that there were some really important reusable primitives here. But on the flip side, IPFS can be thought of as a block store for IPLD. IPLD being at the heart of what IPFS is doing, which is uh, creating and storing and addressing content address blocks uh, of data. And IPFS really turns into a block store for IPLD. So you could view it either way, depending on what you're uh, interested in looking at. IPFS, at its most fundamental, is a collection of binary blobs of data. Uh, which we tend to call blocks, um, and they have associated content identifiers, which we call CIDs. There's a third thing here, which is the, the form they take in memory or outside of the system. So for file data, the form is a file that might exist outside of the system. But there's other forms in memory that where you decode the binary blocks and put them back in again. We'll get into that in detail a bit later on. Um, in IPFS, as you may have already picked up with some of the early material, only the smallest files are actually stored as a single blob. Uh, to keep the block size practical, files are split up into chunks and they're spread across multiple blocks and then linked together into a single graph. So most files in IPFS end up being this, this collection of blocks that are connected into a graph. Uh, and directories also introduce more linking because directories end up being a collection of links. Um, that have names and they point to files which themselves have graphs. And so in the content addressing module, you might have seen uh, this little graph and it's 
a, a just a general conceptualization of what a file might look like in IPFS, where you take a file and you chunk it up using a chunking algorithm that might have efficient deduplication properties. In this example, we can see that there's some of the content is the same, so it's been deduplicated. Uh, we don't have to serve all of the file because some of the file is a duplicate. Um, but what we end up with here is actually a number of separate blocks that are link linked into a graph. Uh, we, we tend to think about these things in IPFS as just one address, but it's actually multiple. So if we break it down, we can actually find six separate blocks in this graph. The root CID at the top there, uh, it tends to be the CID that you'll share. You'll share a well around one address, either the QM, etc., etc., which is a CID V0, or the more um, modern CID V1, which BAFY, BEI, etc., etc. You'll share this around, but what that gets you is a graph, not just the whole file. You can use that to derive the root block, uh, but that root block itself has links that point to additional blocks which themselves point to the leaf data of the file. Um, we call this a Merkle DAG uh, and this is how IPFS does files and each of these things uh, comprises what um, IPLD is uh, specializing in. Fundamental concepts of IPLD and really this is about links and graphs. Now recall Merkle DAG from the content addressing module this is uh, Merkle is a term you'll hear again and again in the content address world. Recall that a DAG is a directed acyclic graph. And there's a picture on the screen there that uh, it's, it's got um, a graph of nodes and it's got arrows uh, indicating that it's directional and it only goes in one direction. Um, you can have graphs that are bi-directional, but when you're content addressing, you're dealing with hashes that are only one way. You can't go back, you can't link back in time with hashing. Uh, sorry, forward in time with hashing, you have to go backward in time. So you end up with this directionality in your graph. And also because of the properties of content addressing, you can't have cycles. And that's the same thing. You can't go forward in time with hashes. You can't hash content that doesn't yet exist. Uh, so you have these one-way graphs. Um, Ralph Merkel, the, where the, term, the name Merkel comes from, he formalized this pattern in, uh, in, in a patent in 1979. And we've been building on this ever since um, to the point where we're now building in economic systems using blockchains and Merkel graphs. So the, 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 the foundation you can think of as content is, uh, that is being hashed may also contain hash digests of other content. So when you're hashing a, a bit of content, that hash, the, the content may itself may include a hash of some other content. That's your graph building where you are pointing to a different piece of content. And by doing that, the parent hash of the data that contains other hashes, you're actually authenticating the content that links that, that it's linked to. And so, and you're including it in the tree. That's why you can have things like a blockchain um, block that is just a simple hash, but it's actually made up of thousands of additional hashes in a, in a graph-like structure. It's the same with Git, which we're going to look at as, a, as an example of how this works, because Git is a fantastic example because uh, most programmers are familiar with the basics of Git. This is what it looks like internally from a hash-linked perspective. Everything in Git is hash-linked, except for some of the named things like tags and branches. Uh, but your file data is all hashed. Each file has a hash, and it just gets created as a blob. Uh, and then those those blobs, those hashes are then bubbled up into these tree structures where you'll have the tree is a directory and that's a list of these blob hashes. And that tree structure is then further either embedded in additional tree structures or bubbles all the way up to the commit. And the commit itself contains that hash, but it also contains a lot of other things like the author and timestamp, committer and timestamp, a message, um, and also a parent link which takes you back in time. So one of the things I want to highlight here is if you're familiar with Merkle trees, common term is Merkle trees, and Merkle trees are usually used to mean a tree of hashes, just strictly hashes where you've got data down the bottom layer. You, you chunk that up and you hash and you append the hashes and then you hash that, etc., etc., all the way to form a strict tree. Now, the definition Merkle tree is that's not it's not strictly that necessarily. We use we tend to use Merkle DAG because it, it, it suggests more flexibility. But um, these Merkle structures don't just have data at the base. They can have additional metadata and additional rich data all the way through the structure. 
Um, and what's interesting is when it bubbles up to the top here is when it is, uh, is when we can start addressing larger content. Now, content addressing immutability, yes, but you can have mutability with content address data structures as with Git. You mutate your Git directory over time. But what that means is your, your hashes then bubble up to the top uh, and you get new hashes each time you change things. So in the example on the screen here, I've got a, 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 a tree, a DAG, um, that I've mutated with some operations. I've added some, removed some. Um, a lot of the content is the same. So many of these hashes uh, will be the same for the content there and their, their parents' hashes will be the same all the way up. But then you get to a point where you start changing things and those changes intersect with non-changing bits and we end up with a different root and a lot of different intermediate pieces in between this graph. And this is a, a typical pattern for mutating content address data. Um, and what you end up with is uh, essentially a way of snapshotting. So if I keep all of the pieces around between these two mutations, I can actually step back in time. And if you think about Git, that's exactly what Git's doing. So let's let's break this Git da example down a tiny bit. Um, now I'm going to use the term Merkle roots here. And uh, a root in the context of Git is your commit hash or commit SHA. And um, that's the thing you tend to pass around when you make a commit. You've got the little string. Um, the SHA-1, soon to be SHA-2, 256, but um, it's, a, it's a little string of, um, of a hash digest. Now, in the Git example I've got on the screen here, very simplistic, starts off on the right there with a single commit with a flat directory containing four files. Those four files are hashed. They are then listed up into the tree object, which is just the list of four hashes. That object then is hashed and then included in the root which we will call the commit um, as the tree. And the, the tree is just a hash string. Um, there's a parent, which is nothing when you start a, a Git repo from the beginning, because there's no parent commit. And a message and a timestamp, author, committer, and then um, you commit this and Git will create this little structure for you and you get back this hash. Then you do some changes. Let's say you add two more files to your directory. So in this example, the, the, the four files that were there haven't changed. They're still the same hashes for those files, but we've added two more. So we had to make a new tree object and place those two additional hashes in there along with the, the existing four. Then we've made a new commit. That commit is going to have a new hash because uh, not only is the tree hash different because it contains these two new things, but the timestamps are different uh, and the message is probably different. And now that we've got a, an existing commit in our repo, the parent hash will be the hash of the previous commit. And in this way, we, we create a fully linked graph through time. So not only can we navigate down to the current snapshot, but we can navigate back in time to previous commits and down into their snapshot. Likewise, if we go and do a bit more complex operation, let's say we delete a couple of files um, and um, pull a couple of files up into a new directory or, or push some other ones down into a subdirectory. Um, then we get these two tree objects. One of them contains the other. So you can see one tree object just has a, a list of hashes. The parent tree object has a list of hashes and also the hash of the, the directory. That goes up into a commit, which itself links to the previous commit. And then we've got our new commit hash. Um, and if we just isolate that, say we just care about the latest version. Say I want to check out this, this particular commit. Um, Git says, okay, well, I need to, I can ignore the history, just want to check out the current one. Um, and you can see we've added a bunch of new files, but we're still referencing three of the original files from the original commit. They're still the same hashes, still the same files. We've removed a couple, we've shuffled a couple around, we've pulled one up into a directory. Um, this is how Git works. And this is a Merkle DAG. This is a hash linked data structure, fully hashed the, the latest commit it will authenticate every part of this tree because the hashes um, include, the, the, the objects include hashes of all the other parts. So that's a, that's a this is um, fundamentally how Merkle DAGs work. Now IPLD uh, is, works the same way, but we take the concept of links and we formalize it so we can make a reusable system that can address more than just Git. We can actually address different kinds of systems. So Git is an isolated system. It lives on its own ecosystem. When you have a Git hash, you know you're working with Git. It lives inside Git. IPLD is, is trying to be a bit more ambitious than that and say, well, 
there's a hash here, but it's a git hash and it's a, it uses this hash function um, and it's over here. So you can actually link multiple content address systems together with IPLD. And CRDs really are at the heart of this. So, so you may recall from the content addressing unit, there was a, a slide on content addressing on um, uh, CIDs. Um, this is a summary of, of the, that content, but uh, CIDs are essentially hashes, just like git, git hashes with descriptions. They tell you the hash function that was used as well as the codec that can be used to interpret the binary data being linked to. So it's a hash plus additional things. The hash digest is represented as something we call a multi-hash, uh, and that is a way of identifying the hash, hash function and the length of the digest. Uh, and you can see on the bottom right there, the multi-hash is in blue. Um, it's got a prefix that tells you the length and the, um, the hash function used. Now, um, the CRD's codec, that's the IPLD format. That tells you what to expect when you get to that block. Um, and it could be it could be Git or it could be JSON. There's a number for JSON, which is in hexadecimal 200. Um, and, or CBOR is another format, hexadecimal 51, or just even raw bytes that says, when you get here, you don't need to do anything with it. The bytes are what you'll find. That's all we care about. That's hexadecimal 55. Now, multi-hash, multi-codec, and CIDs are all part of the multi-format system. Multi-formats is all about self-describing values, and I encourage you to go and have a look at multi-formats.io if you want more details about these things and their specifications. But CIDs are at the heart of IPLD because we care about self-describing links. CIDs are the, the native format of uh, link format of IPLD, and it distinguishes, it distinguishes it from a simple data representation system like Git, Bitcoin or BitTorrent, etc. Um, most serialization formats, data serialization formats like JSON and CBOR um, and others, protobufs, etc., etc., they don't have a native way of representing links, links to content address data. Um, they don't have a native way of representing a, a hash. Um, now you can do it because hashes can be strings or they can be binary. They're just, they're just bytes. You can do that. There's no formal way of saying this is a link to a piece of data. It's you have to build that into your system. IPLD brings its own formats, um, so data formats that represent CIDs natively, so that when you decode, the CIDs emerge out of those that data um, because they are encoded directly into the data. But you can also use IPLD as a lens to view other content addressed uh, data formats, such as Git. And and when you when you use an IPLD codec to uh, to decode Git or Bitcoin, etc. We can actually derive CIDs that's, that say this is a, a Bitcoin format block and it uses this hash function because we know that from the Bitcoin system uh, because it's it's an isolated system. So you could link across to Git or Bitcoin formats using CIDs um, and you would get there, but then you're sort of stuck in that ecosystem. Beyond file data with IPLD. Now we've, we've, we've th been thinking a lot about file data with IPFS. We need to get beyond file data because IPL, the power of IPLD is, is not in file data, it's in the, the complex linked data structures. So the primary IPLD codec that IPFS uses um, it, for files and directories is called DAG PB, PB for protobuf. It's a dedicated protobuf schema for representing a, an array of named links uh, and also a binary blob of data. That's all it does. On top of that, IPFS uh, will decode that binary blob um, in some cases to derive metadata about files. So it, um, it, all of the things about that you care about with files um, can be also encoded in this thing. It's a very file specific format. It's useful, it works for file, works great. Most of the content in IPFS is using DAGPB, um, but it's strictly for files. So with file data, you have fixed layouts and additional metadata properties to represent data structures, sorry, directory structures and you know, what you care about with files. What else do we want beyond that? Well, we, we want to know if we can address and organize complex and large data structures um, with IPLD blocks without having to make everything a file. I don't want to have to put my arbitrary metadata into a JSON file and then encode it into IPFS. If at, that data could itself just live um, natively in the data that I encode. Um, so let's, let's um, t untangle that a little bit as we go on. Um, at the core of IPLD is the data model. Uh, this is the way that we represent forms of data in memory. 
Um, and it's through which codecs transform that memory to and from the bytes. So we, the data model is the formalization of the way we represent data consistently across all codecs um, in memory. And, and this includes IPLD native formats and also Git and Bitcoin and the rest of them. Data model is very familiar. It uses, it has, includes booleans, strings, ints, floats, nulls, arrays, and maps, just like JSON. It's actually really useful to think of the data model as the JSON, the JSON data model, but it also includes bytes and links. JSON doesn't include bytes natively, and it certainly doesn't include links. Um, in the data model for IPLD, IPLD, we include these things as well. Now, beyond DAG PB, two additional formats that currently exist in IPLD, and there will be more, um, are that use the data model in a flexible way, not this fixed schema way, uh, are DAG JSON, which is based on JSON, but it has special forms inside it to deal with links and bytes. I can show you that a little bit in a minute. Um, and DAG CBOR. CBOR is a great format because it's actually really efficient, um, efficient to create and use. It's, it makes it much smaller than JSON. Um, and, but we use CBOR with some strictness rules and we add a, a tag to represent CIDs. So let's have a look at what this means. Uh, on the screen here, I've got a, um, it's just some, this is JavaScript. It could be any language that supports IPLD. Um, so in JavaScript, we've got a, an object. This is a map. Uh, and it's got string, int, float, um, a boolean, array, some bytes, and a link, which is a CID. So this is a, a native link type in memory in JavaScript. And say we want to encode it, we, let's use DAG JSON. This is what we'd do if, I, if you said to IPLD, I want to encode this as DAG JSON. And the most interesting part of this, I think, is the bytes and links pieces, which are very particular forms of JSON that when they do a round trip will actually come out as the same forms because the DAG JSON codec knows what to do with these things. It's also sorted. Uh, that's another thing to get determinism in the format. Um, and on the screen, I've got it with spaces, so it's nicely printed so you can read it, but it's actually, there should be zero spaces in there in, in the, between the tokens in JSON, DAG JSON. So I've just formatted it nicely for you to view on screen. DAG CBOR is much more interesting because it's the system we recommend for building any new uh, system on top of IPLD. Um, Filecoin, interestingly enough, uses DAG CBOR for its entire chain. So we're talking about terabytes of data being created um, regularly uh, for um, Filecoin, for Filecoin chain management with DAG CBOR. CBOR is, a, uh, is, is similar to JSON, but it supports many more data types and it's a binary format, so it's very efficient. Uh, this is the same data I showed you, but in, in DAG CBOR, I've put the hexadecimal at the top there and I've put a diagnostic, diagnostic output version um, that shows you what's what inside there. I won't go into detail there, but it's, it's the same data. And if I was to run this through the DAG CBOR um, in, uh, codec, then I would get these bytes. And then if I was to decode those bytes, then I would get out the same thing. So I could decode it back out into what I had in memory before. Um, so what we end up with is a stable system for addressing, constructing, and encoding data without, uh, for, content, uh, for the content address world. So this is your standard programming constructs but with content addressing data below it and ways to manipulate and navigate these things. If we go further, um, just to recap, uh, IPLD is, is it's the data layer for content address systems, as I said up front, but it's also a suite of technologies for representing and traversing hash linked data. Um, so to do that, we, we use a data model. We have mechanisms for deterministic translation from binary data to the data model and back. And the determinism matters in content address data because same content should ideally have the same hash. So you sort of want your, your content to always produce the same hash if possible. Um, includes addressing and data description primitives, um, which is this multi-formats world and CIDs. But it also includes tools to address, traverse, and mutate large graphs of linked blocks of data. That's where we get really interesting into some um, distributed data structures, which we're gonna look at next. So distributed data structures using content addressing. Um, we end up in a world of persistent and immutable data structures, and this is not new. The programming, the functional programming world leans heavily on the same concept. concept. So you can look through this, just the standard libraries of Scala, Clojure, Haskell, et cetera. They're full of data structures that translate almost directly into the distributed content address world. Sometimes when they get into uh, 
bi-directional graphs, things get a little bit uh, strange. They're not, not really translatable, but very often we're talking about DAGs um, just in memory for these functional programming immutable data structures. Uh, so th this stuff's not new, it's been around for a long time and we get to uh, borrow some of those concepts to build algorithms. Um, so we can have algorithms to build, traverse, mutate content address data structures of these linked blocks of data containing um, da useful data within each of the nodes. Um, and But there's careful consideration of the trade-offs of the algorithms involved here. So this, thing's, this stuff is not super simple. So IPLD is also an effort in trying to pull those things together and come up with some algorithms and some methods to traverse, create, and mutate data structures. So um, I, content addressing gives us the ability to scale. Uh, that's one of the nice things with content addressing. We can do distributed data structures peer-to-peer -peer, and we can scale them uh, arbit almost arbitrarily. We do not have to be li limited by our hard drives or our memory if we can do these things peer-to-peer -peer and store them uh, in distributed systems. So I have an example here. We're going to call it a super large array. Now in this example, we, what we want to do is have an array that can scale almost arbitrarily. Uh, so how can we build a distributed content address data structure uh, that can act like an array? So on the screen, I've got a, just it's a, let's, let's say it's an IPLD block. It's got five elements in it. So our array has five, they could be numbers. They could even be links to other things, but they're just elements in an array like you would normally do in your normal programming language. Um, and we pack them into a block and encode them with a codec and it has a CID. So we've got a CID, one CID and one block. That's great, we have an array and it's content addressed, but is it scalable? Well, let's, let's say that we, want it, we have a maximum block size and we can only fit five of these things into a block. So if we wanna add an additional thing into our block, we sort of, we, we bust the limit that we've set for ourselves. So what do we do if we reach our limits? Well, what we can do is create a graph. So let's add, let's add three more elements here um, and let's link them together with a parent. Now I'm going to call these different layers heights. At the bottom, the leaf layer, we're going to call it height one. And at the top layer, we're going to call it height two. Now height two also contains an array, but it's an array of links this time. So we can keep our rules about maximum block sizes here stable. So let's say we keep it to five. Um, and, but it's just that at height one, our elements are whatever we want to store. And above height one, they are links to the things below. So we're creating a very uh, standard tree structure here. So we've got th uh, three different blocks, three distinct CIDs. Two of them are leaf nodes containing the data we care about. And there's one root at the top there. So with the CID of the root will get us to all of the elements in the array. We'll look at how in a minute. But let's say we want to keep on growing. What do we do? Well, this data structure um, can, if we keep our rule of five, uh, we can actually address up to 25 elements um, and we end up with five leaf nodes and a single root uh, that points down to the leaf nodes. So this is great. We're scaling already. We've, we've got, you know, we've got five by five. Um, and this could be bigger. We could be talking about large numbers here. These blocks could be a lot larger than this, but keeping it small for the example. Now, uh, what do we do if we, if we go beyond this? Well, we're going to have another overflow operation here where we, if we add another one, we're going to break our rule of five at the top there. So what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna do exactly the same thing and add a new layer. And this is height three. So at height three, we end up with an array of two, which link are links, they're CIDs pointing down to the layer, the height two blocks, which themselves have CIDs that point down to the height one blocks. So now we've got 26 elements and we've got three nodes in our graph that don't contain the useful data we care about, but it's all tied together into a single DAG that we can uh, address and reason about and share and have portions of uh, and also traverse. Now, you can imagine this thing scaling to quite large sizes and your heights get quite big. Um, you'd probably pack a lot more into your blocks, uh, but uh, these things could get, potentially get very large and you wouldn't have to keep them all on your computer to address the data you care about. Perhaps you only care about a subset of it. So that's all you need to have. Now, on the screen, I've got a, an algorithm. This is in JavaScript um, and it's just a, a get operation, get index. Uh, I'm not going to walk through the details, but, but essentially when, when we have a, a root and we want to get a particular index of our array, we can build a traversal algorithm that takes that index and figures out how to navigate through 
the graph to get to the child that we care about. Um, and this, this algorithm on the screen will give you uh, a method of traversing if, if a node knows how to get to its child node at a particular index uh, of its own. So at, at, at the root, you've got in two indexes and the, the first intermediate has five indexes and there's one that has one. So you can uh, essentially build algorithms to traverse. Likewise, you can build algorithms to mutate, to add, to remove, um, and to do things like slices, etc. cetera. Um, so um, distributed data structures are also associated with algorithms, but once you build these things as reusable chunks, as reusable pieces, you end up with quite a lot of power. And uh, that's what IPLD is about. IPLD is about ad addressing these, these graphs of data, and we build algorithms as well on top of them to deal with not just file data, but also arbitrary data that you may want to store in a content address system. Now, thanks for watching this uh, presentation. And if you have more questions, please reach out. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We are continuing to improve IPLD. It is working in practice at scale, um, and we'd love to apply it to even more use cases. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next module.